Uh, yes, really, we discussed uh, very thoroughly the economic consequences of the coronavirus, but what about the other aspects? What will the coronavirus impact beyond the global economy and uh, supply chains? We want to hear our speakers assess the other possible consequences of the pandemic vis-a-vis -vis promotion of the BRI in Central Asia. So I yield the floor to our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Raman Vakulchuk. Raman. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I have three main points um, that I would like to stress, and some of them have been already mentioned by my colleagues and also myself. But I would like to start first uh, with the, uh, I think, probably crucial uh, point, and that, that relates to the short-term uh, prospects. Um, and the sort of the rebuilding of uh, economic cooperation uh, between China and Central Asia, as well as other countries. So I think first is that it's really important that the future development of BRI will depend on how fast China can tackle domestic economic difficulties uh, and also dismounting international diplomatic pressure. I think that will, will be very important. And so the longer it takes, the consequences for Central Asia will be harder and more uh, difficult. So I think the, the, the kind of actually the timing of uh, Chinese solving its uh, issues domestically and also internationally will be very important. I also uh, came across an uh, analysis by Kevin Root, who's a former Prime Minister of Australia, who tried to uh, list different type of uh, uh, sort of uh, priorities on the Chinese domestic agenda. And there he says that, well, actually, out of 10 different priorities, uh, Central Asian Belt and Road Initiative, they come as number eight. And then uh, basically all the domestic issues that China needs to solve come as the more important. And I, I think, well, there's certain truth to that, uh, given again all these constraints and also economic difficulties that China is uh, fa facing with. Uh, I think also the fact that um, uh, f uh, depending how China will get back to the uh, Belt and Road uh, agenda, how fast it gets back to this agenda and promoting it, this will also have implications on to what extent projects will be delayed. And I think it's very important probably also to think that probably it will take uh, maybe a couple of years before China uh, could launch new projects. I think there'll be probably quite maybe fast reaction to the projects that have been already started, have been already launched, but it may take a while before there'll be new projects that could continue, continually expanding the uh, well, infrastructure projects, also energy projects in the region. Also then the question is then what to do with the fact that uh, it's not only uh, well, Central Asian companies that uh, carry different uh, short-term risks uh, and also financial burden, but also uh, some of the Chinese uh, state-owned companies. We also know that now they are, there's like this motivation uh, coming from the central Chinese government to withdraw from the risky uh, project overseas. So it may also take a while, uh, and I think there'll be some reconsideration of to what extent uh, Chinese will continue to uh, go like business as usual before the pandemic actually started. Um, and the second point, I think that really the image of China and the Belt and Road Initiative will depend on how China reacts to the post-pandemic situation in Central Asia. So far, we have seen quite limited engagement. Uh, here I talk about, for example, the uh, assistance in terms of the medical supply um, to the countries. Uh, for example, Kyrgyzstan hasn't uh, received much of support, although there were some requests already uh, some countries got some limited support. So I think it will be a very important um, aspect um, that could also have some implications to what extent uh, there will be some rising anti-Chinese sentiment in Central Asia or actually to, to, to the contrary, to maybe there will be actually some you know, um, uh, further uh, build up of some mutual relations uh, and trust quite fast. Uh, but what I really think, again, I would like to stress is that uh, this aspect that has been uh, not very much on the agenda in the existing uh, Belt and Road projects is this issue of sustainability of these projects. Uh, again, issues related to transparency, bankability, also workforce health uh, among the people who take part in the infrastructure project. And I mentioned the study we did last year together with the OEC Academy where we look at uh, uh, 261 Chinese projects. I think one particular area where uh, there's a, there's a big room for improvement uh, has to do with the energy sector. And this was, didn't get much attention in, in, uh, in the international uh, sort of analysis and expertise. 
So there has been quite limited attention to the uh, energy projects. And uh, we counted that over the last 10 years, China invested more than 90 billion uh, US dollars in different types of energy projects in Central Asia. However, uh, less than 1% of this funding went to the green energy and renewable energy. And it's, I think it's quite a, a, par a bigger paradox that you have China as the biggest uh, producer of solar panels and also one of the fast, fastest expanding markets uh, with renewable energy. But then you have very little investment uh, of ch from China to Central Asia, for example, in the area of clean energy. And if you talk about sustainability and especially the long-term prospects of such projects, I think it's really important that uh, there's more, uh, I would say, engagement. And also uh, there should be also more interest from the Central Asian governments to provide conditions for increasing cooperation in this area. Because, I mean, there are many risks on continuing to invest in the traditional energy, and we all know about the uh, stranded assets. So the more there'll be investment in the oil and gas projects in Central Asia, it means that the, the region will be more uh, exposed to some, you know, uh, to more risks concerning the greenhouse gas emissions and possible uh, global carbon tax. So I think this has to be taken into account in any future projects. And the third, the last point, and I, which I think is very important for me, uh, is that there's very little coordination on the part of Central Asia when it comes to the Belt and Road related projects. So what I really think is necessary for Central Asian governments, not only to, to try to deal and solve the uh, crisis, but also in terms of its future, uh, more, I would say, um, effective and successful uh, collaboration with, with China, it's that I think the Central Asian governments, they need to create uh, a regional Belt and Road coordination platform. What we learn again, coming back to this uh, study of 261 projects, we see that they're all implemented on very much still bilateral level. There's very limited coordination and communication between Central Asian governments. While I think that establishing such a platform where all five Central Asian uh, countries and governments could meet would provide a lot of benefits because this would uh, help, for example, to think how to maximize the effects of the common infrastructure projects, right? So how to also identify common risks and opportunities. Because now countries, they very much act on their own and it's very much bilateral. Uh, although, of course, most of the projects that China uh, develops in the region, they are very much uh, regional uh, and they cover lots of regions. So what I really think is important that uh, Central Asia tries to establish such a, a regular platform where they would first meet to discuss all the projects to see how they actually fit and also to what extent they match with the national uh, strategic uh, development plans of those countries. I think there's there are a lot of uh, opportunities there that can be utilized. Uh, and I think there are already some examples. You have the EU-China connectivity platform that was established for the same purpose. So I think that uh, the, the sooner this happens and Central Asian set up such a platform, the better off they would be in terms of maximizing the economic effects uh, from that um, uh, kind of projects. But also I think this could also help in many other smaller aspects. For example, there's a, I think there's a need for joint approach to labor policy. I think the potential to utilize domestic labor has been underexploited and quite underutilized. And now we have the situation with the labor migration, for example, and labor migrants who, um, uh, with remittances stopping in Russia because of the situation, right? But then, of course, I think there's a huge potential for involving more of the local workforce in many of the Chinese projects, which has not been really the case. So in many ways, this could help solve the situation on the ground. With that, I would like to talk. We can take questions, I think, later. Thank you so much, uh, dear Raman, even for your uh, recommendations uh, about a regional Central Asian platform on BRI. Uh, and I'd like to say that in this uh, session, we have two keynote speakers, and the second is uh, sinologist Anton Bugayenka. So, uh, Anton, you're welcome with your speech. Hey, can you hear me? Uh, okay, so yes, um, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, my speech is mostly uh, 
from uh, views is from Kazakhstan side, but also very, I think, very important for uh, other Central Asian states. So for answering the question of uh, BRI future in Central Asia, we should follow three main topics. First, uh, what influence coronavirus, uh, coronavirus crisis will have uh, on all China's economy and the parts related to BRI. Second, what influence crisis uh, will have, um, uh, uh, what influence uh, coronavirus crisis will have on Central Asia uh, economies, especially what parts of economies or industries will lead to recovery, or what influence uh, will crisis have to start its uh, to have to state stability. And the third uh, main question is uh, how China's policy in coronavirus crisis already change, changed uh, in these three, four months. So the first question is influence of coronavirus in China's economy uh, related to BRI. Uh, the first things here is uh, cutting finance resources able to invest uh, in development economies. Chinese companies will concentrate on recovery on the economy. Uh, China also will have a Western withdrawal of production from China. It means Western companies um, perhaps uh, will cut uh, China, not all, but most of them. Um, it's a new trend on uh, regionalization. And the uh, second thing here is unemployment problem. Um, if you know that in China now it's a, it's a big uh, problem. Um, last year it's around 6% of uh, unemployment uh, Mm, unemployment in China is uh, around six percent. So, uh, and um, now this problem much b will be bigger, and um, it means that Chinese companies can't export jobs to other states. Uh, what's very important? Uh, what was very important for Central Asian states? Because if you see the all new projects, we usually look to how is um, how ma how many uh, jobs creating in central uh, in our economies so um, second things uh, Chinese economy will be more isolated from the world economy system here will be two ways from isolation and orientation on the domestic market Chinese economy will not need new investments abroad but it's uh, discussable uh, things. So the second way is, uh, is if Chinese economy after isolate and concentrate on, on its market domestic economy become bigger and bigger and Chinese comp uh, companies will need expansion outside of China. This point is more related to manufacturing sector and less related to mining and technologies because uh, they have uh, own uh, trends. So and technologies. Uh, China will have a technological uh, breakthrough uh, means technological revolution. You see, it's world technological revolution starting in China. Uh, 5G as example. Uh, for and uh, here it's a. Uh, one, China's economy will export uh, some technological solutions to elite states. Uh, this will uh, be a new interesting element of uh, political part of BRI. And the second, um, from technology uh, development and if China, uh, uh, from te technology development, uh, China, uh, after China start to reopen economy, um, Chinese companies will be able to export simple production chains. So here we'll be see a new uh, period of um, Chinese companies able to create new jobs in uh, Central Asian states. Um, so uh, second main question is influence of coronavirus in uh, Central Asia related to be right. Uh, here's the first uh, main thing, it's falling down of small and medium business include my ma uh, machine industry, manufacturing, uh, manufacturers, Mm. Perhaps this place in economy will be taken by uh, Russian big companies. They are bigger and active in one Eurasian economic union area and uh, they will have a government supporting. So I heard here some of uh, speakers already said that the Russian economy is very strong and uh, we are in one union and after our small and medium business uh, falling down, uh, some Russian companies can uh, can um, uh, take some of uh, of piece of this cake uh, in Central Asian economies. Uh, 
So uh, Chinese, uh, here is Chinese business positions in these parts of economy. It's manufacturing, service, or uh, some other uh, part, parts like this. Uh, not so strong as Russian, but uh, Chinese business also will take a part of this cake and became the systematically significant. Now it's not, um, if we see this, for example, in Kazakhstan, this 51, uh, now it's 56 projects. Um, actually, uh, they have um, a lot of positive things for our, our, our Kazakhstan economy, but um, no, they're not systematically significant. And in the future, we'll see this Chinese, Chinese companies uh, in uh, not only in oil industry, but in the other uh, parts of economies will be grow up. Uh, so the second uh, main things here, it's uh, income reduction in mineral resources export. There will be two main results of deals with China. Um, first is supply expansion uh, to the Chinese market. After the period of recovery, Chinese economy will need more resources. Uh, European Union, it's Kazakhstan main uh, market uh, of oil for oil uh, export, need more time to recovery. And Chinese market will be a good alternative, especially in the front of uh, competition or, of oil exporters in Euro, uh, Europe Union, as well, Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia. So China is uh, China is a low price but it's stability at the growing market. So uh, maybe we will uh, see some, or some new infrastructure and refinery projects here. Um, second, oil, uh, second uh, things from uh, income reduction. Uh, oil price failing led us uh, to pay attention on other uh, export things, uh, especially it's mining, iron, steel, ore, um, and China here is already its number one destination of our exporters, uh, especially for Kazakhstan, but uh, other Central Asian countries too. Um, so the third main thing is failing living standards. After states, a government can't support uh, social system on the level they had before. Uh, this will have some effects for stability and let public failing uh, to the social upheaval. Um, in this situation, some actors will use a xenophobia in interior policy, and they will have an occasion. China will try to take back its own uh, loans, as, uh, I mean, money from gov from Central Asian states governments. Uh, and uh, yeah, I I apologize for interrupting you. Uh, you have one minute. Okay, uh, I almost finished. Uh, the, first, the third question is how China's policy in coronavirus already changed in these three, four months. Uh, this topic we will con concentrate on the next session, so I just tell just a few moments here. Uh, now we see a big aggressive Chinese reaction, but this first this reaction is uh, reaction goal is uh, resist United. States. Uh, the second is not aggressive to official governments, but it's badly affecting to the public opinion. So, and here I will very briefly just to say uh, the future of BRI. Uh, my vision on the future of BRI include two parts. Mid-term uh, is the pause of implementation, and the long term it's a resuming, impl uh, resuming implementation of BRI. Uh, in midterm, it's around one to three years. Uh, uh, China will stop uh, many projects uh, because of technical reasons. It's lockdown and uh, others, and also about the, because of less finance resources. Um, and um, China will quit from some projects. It's not effective for Chinese economy uh, in isolation trend and uh, projects with political uh, motivation, which also non effective for Chinese economy. And in the long term, China's uh, goals after crisis will be to take resources from own economy, making our own production chains. And the three is uh, do not uh, let Central Asia become anti-Chinese region. Uh, perhaps for this, China will cooperate with Russia. Um, and the rest of things I will say in the next session. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Lee Anton. We have also two commentators in this session, and maybe our commentators have a alternative point of view or some additions. So let me give the floor to Dr. Catherine Owen. Thank you. Uh, they were both really interesting, um, really interesting talks. I would say um, 
I absolutely agree that um, China's response uh, in Central Asia uh, will have a big impact on public feeling um, and that hitherto it has been very limited, um, particularly in this region, which, as we know, um, does harbour quite significant Sinophobic uh, sentiments. Um, so, I, yeah, I do feel that um, China could really up its... Uh, I suppose, health diplomacy uh, in, in the region. Um, but actually, um, I, I interpreted the questions we were sent uh, somewhat differently to, uh, to the speakers. Um, just for the audience, we were asked um, whether it's relevant to compare political regimes um, or whether there are any universal tools that, that, that might help. Um, and so I sort of was thinking about this question um, and um, I sort of thinking about it perhaps a little bit more abstractly. And um, I, I guess, my thought here is that actually, yeah, it, when we're thinking about political regimes, the democracy authoritarian uh, binary uh, is really not uh, the key factor here, um, but actually um, state capacity is. Um, and by state capacity, I mean the um, ability to mobilize and distribute resources and, and, and services. Um, so, you know, there's been a, there's quite a lot of interesting sociological work done on this notion of um, state capacity. I'm particularly thinking of work like uh, Charles Tilley, um, who says that you know protection of citizens or, or subjects or citizens is one of the four key activities of, of the state. So if we just take, uh, for example, Russia and China, uh, both countries may be broadly described as authoritarian, yet uh, Russia is doing relatively badly in managing the crisis, yet China has done relatively well. Similarly, uh, speaking about democracies, we could say both the UK and uh, Germany are democracies, yet the UK is doing quite badly, uh, while, the UK, uh, while Germany is, is, is doing much better. Um, so what do Russia and uh, UK and China and Germany have, have in common? I would say that the former have a l lower levels of state capacity following years of uh, austerity and, and state restructuring, whereas uh, China and Germany have a much higher levels uh, of uh, a much better funded public sector and are much better able to uh, distribute uh, and mobilize uh, resources. Um, what this means for the context of Central Asia, of course, is that actually in all five countries, um, the uh, state capacity is, is, is relatively weak, uh, although obviously stronger in, 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 in some than, than, than others. Um, but I do think that, yeah, considering this question of, of, of democracy versus as authoritarian, authoritarianism is one uh, that's, that's very, very interesting to, to look at in this regard. Thanks. Thank you, dear Dr. Catherine. Uh, and now let's uh, listen to uh, sinologist uh, Timur Umara. So, Timur, you are welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I also um, want to thank everyone for organizing this great um, event today. Um, I uh, also got the... Um, uh, when we got this um, plan, I was thinking about this um, comparison of political regimes um, and how they respond to um, coronavirus. I definitely agree with Catherine um, on um, uh, the, the feature that um, fighting those kind of pandemics, um, it, it is very important to have um, this ability to move resources from one place to another. Uh, so. Um, they can cope with um, many um, ill uh, people at the same time and stuff like that. But um, in uh, when we talk about Central Asia, um, I guess um, it is true to say that um, if uh, you have a... Um, I'm not... Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that uh, authoritarian... Uh, regime is better or uh, anything like that. But um, in in case of emergency, um, it, I think it's true to say that um, in authoritarian states, um, the power that uh, the state has over uh, controlling the movement of the population is uh, much stronger than in uh, dem democratic um, states. Uh, at least um, those who rule those kind of uh, countries don't have, uh, you know, problems with uh, people getting annoyed um, or uh, people uh, talking about human rights um, because they um, actually 
um, were not lucky enough to have um, all of the human rights before the crisis. So um, I guess for um, authoritarian states, it is a bit easier um, to, um, for example, lock the cities as uh, China did, um, lock the regions or um, close the borders um, than it is um, in other states. Um, and uh, talking about universal tools or approaches, I guess there are, um, when we talk about uh, fighting pandemic um, or localizing the virus, um, there are universal tools. Um, uh, first of all, you just um, have to uh, uh, practice social distancing. Um, like, uh, there, are, there are two ways, okay. Um, first way is the um, Chinese way and the, the way that um, many other countries followed um, Central Asia as well. Um, and the other one is the um, uh, Taiwan and South Korea cases. Um, as you know, in those countries, um, they um, started as early as possible tracking those people who supposedly have um, coronavirus and um, using uh, surveillance cameras and uh, technology to make sure that all of the people that uh, those people have contact with are uh, tested. Um, so um, more, you have one minute okay um so this is definitely not the case for central asian states that's why they decided um and it's a very wise decision to um just close the borders um close the people in their homes um so the virus would not have um any chance to uh transfer from people to people Thank you, dear Timur. Uh, thank you to our keynote speakers, uh, to our commentators. I think this session was too long, maybe because of this very interesting topic. And I also would like to add that uh, I agree with uh, Raman that uh, Central Asia, uh, China, multilateral relations depend not only on China, but also on Central Asian countries that must be uh, more active and uh, uh, coordinate BRI projects. So let me close this uh, session and give the floor to my colleague Ermek Baisalov.